last week prior we talked about Paul um, and how he was a martyr um, and really did a great job defining what a martyr was and explaining Paul's life and just how he was before giving his life to Christ and how he allowed his life um, to be a great way to pay for a lot of people in our generation now um, and just how he had to give his life and well, all the sacrifices that he had to endure as um, being a servant of Christ. And so this week, we are going to be talking about <coughs> John the Baptist. That my dog. That my dog. Um, and I was reading up on his story, um, trying to refresh my mind. Um, I've heard his story countless of times. Everybody's heard about John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. Ooh, he baptized Jesus. But there's so much more um, to his story, like the little details that we pass over. Um, I feel like people don't give him as much credit. They just see him as Jesus' cousin and the guy that baptized Jesus. But he's so much more than that. Um, and so a little background on John. So, John, of course, is the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth, um, and they were at an old age. <clears throat> and when they were going to conceive, they didn't know or think that they could conceive, conceive. Um, but, um, you know, an angel of the Lord came and appeared to them and told them, like, yes, you are going to bear a son and you shall name him John. Um, and Zacharias was just like... What you mean I'm gonna bear a son? Like you crazy? And so because of that, the angel of the Lord was just like, because you didn't believe me, you will be mute until your son comes. And so I felt like, dang, that was rough. That was a little tough. Like, dang, is that crazy? You could've just kept your mouth shut just a little bit and you could've been able to speak. But you know, everything happens how it's supposed to happen. You know, we read these stories and we're just like, dang, times was rough back then. We don't get the same type of uh, persecution of how they used to get, and not as rough at least, but they used to get it rough. Um, and so, you know, they came to um, Elizabeth telling her, yes, you're gonna bear a child and we shall name him John. And one thing I found extremely crazy and I don't think I ever realized it. You know, we read it so much, but we don't we don't read it. Like we just, oh, skin Mario, yeah, John, John. Yeah, mm -hmm. Elizabeth, that's Mary cousin or whatever, okay, cool. But in the Bible, it literally says that John was filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb, like, I think that's a detail that we passed by. I don't think I ever realized that it said that. Like, wow. Another thing I realized as I was reading is I realized that a lot um, of the great people in the Bible, whenever they were going to be born, um, there was always an angel of the Lord that appeared and said like, hey, you are going to bear this child and your child shall be named this for this specific reason. Like, you know, Jesus, they came to Mary. Hey, Mary, you're going to bear this child and you shall name him this. Hey, Elizabeth, you're going to bear this child. You shall name him this. Abraham, you're going to have a son. You shall name him this. And I just found that so crazy. Like, all these people, before they were born, their life was already predestined. And it just taught me, like, wow. Um, what about our lives? Like, we just think, like, oh, our life is just here. Yeah, okay. You know, my parents gave, you know, they gave birth to me. And, of course, everybody has a purpose in life. And everybody's supposed to do something. But literally, like, no. Like, people in the Bible, prophets were able to go and tell other fam like family members, like, this is the layout of your child's life. Like, your child is going to be born. This is their name. And this is their journey. Like, John was supposed to be one who was going to be the greatest. Like, he's going to have favor with God. He's going to be loved by God. He's That name is going to do so much alone. Imagine hearing all that. You didn't have you didn't even give birth to your child. Like, oh, so my son's name is John. And he's going to do what? Like, imagine hearing that now. But they had so much faith back then. Like, yo, man, this prophet is legit telling me about my baby. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean like life isn't going to take its course and things won't happen. But literally, like we have a predestined 
purpose for our life. Our life is not here by accident. We have a divine purpose. So even in your mother's womb, you have that purpose. You have a plan mapped out for you. Your name has something attached to it. There's an attachment to your name, whether you don't see it, whether it wasn't prophesied to you at birth, whether your parents didn't tell you about a story about, man, somebody came to me and told me about this. There is still a purpose mapped out for you. Like there's a plan mapped out for you. And I just found that so crazy about John. Um, so as we continue about John, I apologize. Just going, it just came to my mind as I was reading the scripture, but he was born. We know the story about how he flipped in the tummy when uh, Mary came and said like, hey, I'm going to bear the son. I'm going to be having the, the son of God. And um, John leaped with joy. And that was a confirmation um, of what was told to Mary. So in that moment, she was like, dang, oh no, it's real. It's real, real. And so that's amazing. And I love that God always gives a confirmation. He doesn't leave you blind. Um, it may not come at the time you want, but there's always a confirmation. He's not going to just leave you like, eh, what? What you want me to do? Wait, what? You just want to give me a word and not confirm it? You ask and he will give you that answer um, with fervent prayer. And so do it. Pray, read your word. There's always an answer. Um, and so I love that. But um, yeah, so <coughs> apologize. And so I was continuing to read about John and, you know, he... He is what I would consider like, was there hippies in the time of Jesus? I'm just gonna call John a hippie, right? So John wore like camel's hair um, and he had like a leather belt. I don't really know how that outfit would look like. Was that, is that like considered like a chinchilla coat and a belt? Like I feel like it looks something like that. Camel's hair and a, a leather belt. What kind of outfit would, I don't, you know, I don't feel like I could have, I couldn't wear the outfits in the past. Like, it was really weird to me. But camel's hair and um, a leather belt. And he would eat locusts and honey. And I read that and I was just like, oh my gosh, what the, what's the significance of that? Like, why not the regular clothes that everybody else has? And why not eat, like, the lamb? and whatever they cooked in the farm, like had in the farm that they cooked, like why not eat that? I um, mean, it just, um, I thought of just like, wow. So in a way it reminded me of fasting or people who didn't require much because they know that the, pl the pleasing that they desired wasn't in the necessities of life, but the desire and the pleasure came from being in the presence of God or spending time with God. And I was just like, dang, you know, do I do that? Like, will I be okay eating the bare minimum or wearing the, or having, let me not say wearing the bare minimum, I need to have clothes on, but having the less fashionable clothing, will that be okay? Or do I need to have these things to make me feel a certain way or feel like oh man this is what I need in order to show that I'm a follower of God I need to have my classy heels and my long flowy skirt and I have to have my hair done a certain way my makeup done a certain way or well, I need to have brunch every Sunday after church don't get me wrong if you do it you do it but it just showed me like for him it wasn't necessarily about pleasantries it was more so like I just need what I need to survive to eat and I'll go from there my purpose in life isn't about to look fashionable. It's not about um, eating the finest things, but it's about getting my work done. And so that was his main focus. And I also love that about him. And so, yes, of course, we know that he went on to being a great servant of God. He spoke the word of God. He told the people that Jesus is coming, y'all. Be prepared. Repent now. Get baptized now. You know, cleanse away. Cleanse your sins right now. Do it now. Um, and so he would baptize people. Um, and it came to the point where he's telling them like, yo, y'all, listen, man, Jesus is going to come. He going to come. He going to baptize y'all. He going to fight out with the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus comes and Jesus is just like, what's up, guys? And you get baptized. And I just wondered what John thought at that moment. Like, I just sat here and I told everyone, like, yo, 
Jesus is coming and he's going to baptize y'all. And now you coming to me, like little old me, and you're telling me like, oh no, it's not even about, like I need you to baptize me. And I just thought, I just thought of just like, you know, man, like how humble, how humbling that had to have been for John to baptize you know, such a mighty person, the person who who he was preaching about, you know, who he felt he didn't have any worth to even talk, like to, to baptize, like you're coming to me. Like I would expect like my, the person I follow, you're going to baptize me. I'm under you, you know, like you're my leader. You come and baptize me. But Jesus was just like, no, I need you to baptize me. And I was just like, man, like that's so crazy. Um, and so, you know, John did that. John was fire, man. Um, and still he continued to do what he was doing, um, still baptizing people in the name of Jesus, you know. And when it came time for John to die, I felt like it was a little, a little hurt by it. Because I was like, dang, like, you know, I felt like it was a little painful. Like, how painful would that be if we had it? But, um, so... John had got um, incarcerated. Is that a big word? John was in jail um, <clears throat> for foolish, foolish reasons, saying, no, don't sleep with her. She got a husband. Got a husband. That's that's all. Um, but when you speak out of term, back in the day when there's rulers, they don't really care. Um, and so what I found interesting is that it seemed like he was supposed to be dead already, but they didn't because um, <clears throat> Herod was saying like, yo, this man was supposed to die, but he has such a high hat in the world. He felt like that couldn't be on him. But when he had a party and it was just like, oh, what do you want? The daughter said, I want the head on a platter. And so they went and they beheaded John and placed his head on a platter and served it to the daughter. Now, I don't think she ate it. I don't think she ate it. Just when I say serve, they brought it to her. They brought it to her on a platter. Um, and I was just mm -hmm. like, I feel like, dang, that's such a cruel way to die. All the work that you've done, the people that knew you and everything that you worked so hard for and to say that your head was served like it was a dish I feel like I would be so angry like if I was part of his family and I had to hear that like are you kidding me but um that's what people in the Middle East deal with now unfortunately you know they get beheaded they get sliced and diced up um, because of their beliefs and because they say no to certain things like no I won't do this because it goes against my belief you know why would I do this I'm gonna stand for what I believe in um, and so that's how John died too. I'm not gonna do that. Why would I do that? You're gonna kill me for speaking out of turn for something that you shouldn't be doing anyway? And so he passed um, in that crucial way. And I was just like, man, um, he was such a great person from before the time he was born. And yet he had to endure such a terrible death.